Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening for our Fertility 101 webinar hosted by Dr. Morgan Massingale. I'm Olivia with Ethos Integrative Medicine. I'll be moderating this webinar. Before we start, please remember to mute your microphones. And if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the chat. Be sure to answer them at the end for you. If you have any specific questions, questions pertaining to your personal care, we cannot address that tonight in our webinar, but I highly recommend scheduling a free 15 minute consultation with Dr. Morgan. Um, she'll be able to answer all of those questions for you and help you to navigate any treatment options. So I'll go over more information about that at the end. Um, today is all about covering what they didn't teach us in high school, aka we'll be diving into the menstrual cycles, the days in which you can actually conceive, other environmental or even health factors that can affect your fertility, um, and answering any other questions you may feel that you didn't get answered um, in those education classes. So. I'd like to start off our webinar by introducing our amazing women's hormone specialist and regenerative orthopedics expert, Dr. Morgan Massingale. This webinar topic is very near and dear to her and one of her biggest goals as a physician and as a mom is to help other moms um, stay healthy and active so they can be the superheroes that they are. So I hope you all get the chance to connect with Dr. Morgan. She's a fantastic resource. And without further ado, I'll let her get started with her presentation. Thank you so much, Olivia. Really appreciate it. Um, so like Olivia was saying, this is a topic that's really near and dear to my heart. Um, Fertility 101. Um, one of the things uh, and the reasons that I am hosting this webinar tonight is a lot of times um, I have patients come in and they sit across the table from me and the information that they learn in high school health class really didn't prepare them to understand just the basics of what happens with their own bodies on a, uh, a monthly basis. Um, I see this both with patients who are seeking fertility advice, as well as, you know, just general hormone patients. Um, so, you know, kind of where I'd like to start is just kind of giving you an overview of what the menstrual cycle is, um, different things that your doctor should be asking you about, um, whether you are seeking fertility or, you know, other hormone concerns, um, so that you can like be prepared and fully um, engaged in your own health. So today we'll be going over the basics of the menstrual cycle, the basics of sperm, because that's the other 50% of what's going on here, um, how you actually predict ovulation, um, some common barriers to conception, and kind of what we can do about it. Um, so I'm going to start off with a little bit about me and why uh, I'm here today. Um, so I'm Dr. Morgan Massengale. Uh, my specialty that's pertinent here is in women's health. Um, I do have a master's in physiology and biophysics uh, that I earned in 2007 at Georgetown University. Um, it took a few years before I decided I want to uh, become a physician and uh, got my naturopathic uh, medical degree at the Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine. Um, and then I actually did a two-year residency training at the Neil Reardon Center for Regenerative Medicine. So the menstrual cycle, well, I think we've all seen some version of this really complicated graphic, right? There's a lot of information that's <laughs> bundled in here. Um, what does it actually mean, right? Um, so let's start with the basics. The menstrual cycle is actually um, the whole range of the 28 days for a typical woman. So it's day one of bleeding to the next day one of bleeding. Um, the segment of your menstrual cycle where you actually um, experience bleeding um, is called menses. And for your average woman, that lasts about three to five days. Um, no one's really average, right? So one of the pertinent questions that your doctor should be asking you is how long um, or how many days of bleeding you actually experience, how heavy those days are, and they can kind of gauge that based on asking you um, how much protection you're using and what type of protection, meaning pads or tampons or um, menstrual cups, how often you're changing those out, if you're changing them for hygiene or because they are fully saturated, um, if you're experiencing any clots in your menses, that gives us a really good clue as to the balance of your estrogen and progesterone, which are your two dominant um, female hormones. Um, from there, they should also be asking you, you know, the length of the menstrual cycle. So how long is it from day one of your menses to the next day one of your menses? Um, very rarely do I see a woman who is 
28 days on the dot unless they are using some sort of hormonal contraception, which does regulate and create a, um, a period every 28 days. So let's talk about the different phases. We all kind of think of menses as the end of our menstrual cycle, um, but it is actually the beginning. It's days one through five-ish for the average woman. From there, we go into the follicular phase, which is typically day six through 14. Um, what's happening during this phase? Your estrogen should be rising, uh, which actually causes the lining of your uterus to become thicker. Um, and then FSH, which is follicular stimulating hormone, is produced during this time and it causes maturation of the eggs within your actual ovary. Um, most people don't know that during a typical menstrual cycle, there is more than one egg that is actually being matured um, by this follicular stimulating, stimulating hormone. Um, but the LH surge, so the luteinizing hormone surge at day 14, again, this is for an average woman, day 14 is not day 14 for everybody. Um, that surge causes one of those mature eggs to actually be released from the ovary. Now this is, you know, typical again. So if you have a genetic predisposition to twins in your family, a lot of times, especially with fraternal twins, this is where um, you're getting the, the twin from is it's uh, two eggs are being released during the, um, during the cycle instead of just one. After ovulation, a, um, an ovum is actually only viable for 12 to 24 hours. So if you are actively trying to conceive, you really need to know um, when that ovulation day occurs for you. Is it actually happening on day 14 or is it happening on day 12? Is it happening on day 16? Um, and we'll kind of talk about why that's important as we get into our, our male counterparts and the viability of sperm and how that all adds up together. Um, so after ovulation, you enter into the luteal phase of your, um, your menstrual cycle, which is typically days 14 through 28. Um, during this time, your levels of progesterone actually rise and they peak around day 21. So if you're having a practitioner who's running labs for you um, and they're checking on your, your um, estrogen, your progesterone, these actually peak at different times in your cycle and should actually be evaluated at different times of your cycle. So if they're just randomly drawing labs, they're you know, not getting a, a good picture of what's actually happening um, in your body for your cycle. Um, that progesterone, that rising progesterone stabilizes the lining of the uterus, um, which is preparing uh, that endometrium for implantation. If no implantation occurs, the levels of estrogen and progesterone will both drop significantly. Um, and that is actually what causes the um, shedding of that uterine lining, leading to menses, which is actually the start of your next cycle. So let's talk about our other halves, right? The, uh, the sperm, what's going on there? Um, after ejaculation, sperm is only viable outside of the human body for 20 minutes or less. Um, so if you are you know, going through fertility treatments, um, going through uh, fertil fertility evaluation, um, sperm donation for evaluation actually needs to happen in a center uh, because there's really no way that you're going to get viable sperm to be analyzed into a lab quickly enough. Um, from there, um, ejaculated sperm in the vagina are viable for several hours. Um, this time is actually increased during ovulation because the body's fairly smart um, and it lower or it raises, sorry, the pH of the vagina. The vagina on a typical uh, non-ovulating day is actually fairly acidic, um, which is why the spermies die more quickly. Um, if they're able to reach the cervix and uterus, they can actually be viable for up to five days. So if we kind of look at the windows of, you know, that 12 to 24 hours of a egg being viable and the five days of a um, nicely swimming sperm viability, there's about six days within a typical menstrual cycle where you are actually able to conceive, um, which kind of is different than the message you might've gotten from, you know, the mean girls uh, health coach there. That <laughs> every time you have sex, you will get pregnant and get chlamydia and die. Right. So um, it's a little, little more complicated than that. Um, 
Interestingly enough, the um, sperm count also matters, right? So if you have a healthy, typical ejaculate, it's about 200 million sperm um, that are um, um, emitted. Only 10 to 20 of those, uh, because of you know, motility, um, viability, that sort of thing, actually reach the egg in the fallopian tube and it could even possibly um, you know, cause fertilization. get my slide to move forward. There we go. Um, so who's average? I, I haven't met uh, such a person. Um, like I said, you know, a typical woman, uh, 28 days is a regular cycle. Um, and we really saw that to be more standard pre-industrialization of our culture, right? When women uh, up, were up with the sun, they got morning exposure and they, you know, went to bed with uh, with the setting of the sun, stress levels were a lot lower. Uh, our diet was a lot different. Um, and a lot of times we actually saw that women synced up to the lunar calendar and had their menses during the new moon. Um, we don't really see that anymore. We're not getting outside and um, stimulating um, you know, our pituitary function in the morning. We are not going to bed when the sun goes down. Uh, we have an immense load of stress. Um, and interestingly enough, our body really can't differentiate um, mental, emotional stress or physical stress. And we'll kind of talk about how that affects our cycle um, in a little bit. So how do we know when we're actually ovulating, right? Um, there are four kind of tried and true methods um, that patients can use. Tracking your basal body temperature is definitely one of those methods. Um, taking your temperature daily first thing in the morning is gonna give you that basal um, temperature of your body. Um, if you go back a few slides, it has that temperature overlay, right, of how that fluctuates uh, through your cycle. Your temperature will have a slight dip the day before you ovulate, and then it will spike the day of ovulation. If you are using the basal body temperature method, I really encourage patients to use one of the apps that we'll discuss later, because that change in body temperature is actually much more slight um, than I think... Uh, we think about it as um, it's a very um, minimal change. And unless you've been tracking your basal body temperature for several cycles and you're just doing it on your own, you may actually miss that slight bump in your temperature. Um, the other thing to consider here is that it's very important to have a reliable thermometer. Um, there's actually only one FDA cleared thermometer um, that is um, FDA cleared to track cycles and to track fertility um, because of the precision with which it is actually calibrated. Um, I see this a lot, especially in um, women who are trying to get a good temperature on, a, on an infant or a child or kiddo that is sick. Um, they'll have four different thermometers in the house and they'll give them four different readings. Um, and when you're you know, tracking something so slight, um, you really need to have a reliable thermometer. LH strips um, are another um, reliable method of predicting ovulation. Um, you, uh, they are small strips that are just uh, very similar to a um, at-home pregnancy test. Um, using a little bit of you know, first thing in the morning urine, um, it's able to measure if you're having that LH surge, so the luteinizing hormone surge that actually causes the release of an egg. Um, these are available over the counter. They're not very expensive. Um, but if you do have a condition like PCOS, you can get false positives with LH because your natural LH level is a lot higher. Um, another reliable method of um, predicting ovulation is cervical mucus. Um, so this is an option um, that some women are just not comfortable with, which is totally uh, understandable. Um, but you do insert two clean fingers into the vagina and then check the color and the texture of the cervical mucus um, by trying to spread it uh, between your two fingers. Right after menses, it'll feel a bit dry. Um, right before ovulation, it'll feel a bit sticky. Um, during ovulation, typically it's more slippery. And then after ovulation, it goes back to that sticky or dry um, texture. If you're choosing to use this particular method, you do want to track for a few cycles to know what your dry, sticky, and slippery feel like for you, right? Because this isn't something that is gonna be necessarily comparable from woman to woman. 
Um, the last method that um, I typically recommend with patients is salivary ferning. Um, so one of the interesting things that uh, they've discovered, and I've talking to Olivia about this the other day, like we don't really know who decides to, to check these things out to know that they're, they're happening. Um, but you can actually take a small amount of sublingual saliva. So saliva from just under your tongue and dot it onto a microscope, allow it to dry, and then look at the pattern of um, the dried saliva on the microscope. Um, during ovulation, the saliva will actually create a fern pattern. So just like the leaves of a, of a fern plant. Um, and there are microscopes that are specifically designed um, for this. Um, they almost look like little small tubes of lipstick. So you can kind of be discreet and keep it in your cabinet. But interestingly enough, it says like uh, ferny micro or like ovulation microscope on it. So I don't know why they uh, <laughs> printed that in large letters if they're trying to be discreet. Anyway. Um, it's reusable, you just clean it off every morning uh, before you put the saliva on there. And it does um, reliably have a ferning pattern on the day of ovulation, um, which is really kind of convenient um, to have at home. So this is a lot of information, right? We're tracking how many days we're bleeding, how long it is between bleeding. We're tracking either a basal body temperature, cervical mucus, or LH positive strips. Uh, there's, uh, there's a ton of information, right? Um, so how do you best organize this to bring all of this to your physician? And there's a few apps out there that are actually super helpful in capturing this information. Um, on this slide, I've listed three um, of the free apps that are available out there on the market, Clue, Flow, and Glow. Um, those are all free. Clue very nicely has information sharing. Um, so you might kind of, why would I want to share that information? Um, it can be very helpful to share with your partner with which you're trying to conceive <laughs> so that they know, um, you know, what the best days are, right? Um, it also allows you to share with your physician. Um, so they can have a, um, you know, physician facing uh, portion of the app. Um, and they're able to kind of look through all the information and help you decipher, um, you know, what that information means. Um, Clue is actually the most widely used um, tracking app on the market. And so it does have a really wide data set. So its algorithm is actually pretty good at predicting ovulation and telling you um, your fertile window days. Um, the next one on there is Flow. Um, it also has a really great interface. It captures a lot of the same information as Clue. Um, the last time I checked, it did not have the ability to info share with either a partner or with your physician. Um, they may you know, update that in the future. Um, and the data set is a little bit smaller because it's not as widely used as Clue. Um, Glow is a really nice app as well. Um, and it's specifically for women looking um, at fertility issues, um, especially women that have now entered the kind of IVF um, area. Um, it helps them track um, you know, track treatments, track ovulation, um, that sort of thing. And it captures a lot more information that's pertinent to people undergoing fertility treatments. Um, two of the paid versions, so they uh, require subscriptions, are UbiKit and Natural Cycles. Um, UbiKit does allow for information sharing. It um, connects to your physician and the physician has a, you know, a physician facing um, interface so they can see all your information. Um, and it does come with um, LH strips. Um, that's part of why it requires the, the subscription. Um, it captures the LH surge and it also captures progesterone levels. Um, so that's another way that we can confirm that you didn't just have an LH surge without ovulation, um, that you had an LH surge and you know, your progesterone le levels continue to rise. So that is really great information to be able to capture and track. Um, the last one on here is natural cycles. Natural cycles is a basal body temperature um, uh, device and app. Um, so it is a very well calibrated thermometer um, and it is the only FDA cleared um, app and tracking system on the market. They originally um, created natural cycles to use as a contraceptive method, um, but obviously they have been able to 
invert the information and invert the uh, the red and green colors um, for people who are actually wanting to track fertility and know their best days of, of for conception. So we're going to get into a little bit more about infertility and recurrent loss. Um, one of the reasons that I wanted to have this uh, webinar, um, I think we really deserve um, women in this arena in the kind of typical allopathic uh, model. Infertility is defined as a failure to conceive after one year of unprotected intercourse. Um, that's under the age of 35. Uh, once a woman progresses over the age of 35, um, they will consider infertility after six months. Um, and then over the age of 40, uh, they can actually see a fertility specialist kind of right off the bat. Um, and then recurrent loss is defined as three or more miscarriages. Um, and the data is actually showing us that the reason that a woman has um, her first miscarriage is the reason that she has her second her third and any subsequent miscarriages. So why are we allowing women to go through multiple losses before we are getting them to a fertility specialist to investigate why these losses are occurring? To that end, there are four major reasons that women typically suffer pregnancy loss or infertility. Uh, the first being polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, polycystic ovarian syndrome really is more of a metabolic disorder that presents as a hormone imbalance. Um, so you're seeing a um, insensitivity to insulin, which is actually leading to anovulation. So the inability to ovulate or release an egg. Interestingly, the egg quality is actually preserved in these patients. So if you can deal with the insulin sensitivity part and get them to ovulate, the quality of the eggs that are in the ovary are actually great. Um, the hormone imbalance that these patients present with is high androgens, so high testosterone um, and DHEA, and low, um, you know, more female um, sex hormones, so your estrogen and your progesterone. Uh, we see this pattern quite a bit when we look at, you know, day three and day 21 labs. Um, and there's a lot of um, consideration of environmental exposures and stress um, to why we are seeing this, um, this hormonal imbalance kind of pop up more often with women. Um, physically, um, I, it has become kind of a um, stereotype, I guess, that women with PCOS have to be um, overweight or obese, and that's just not the case. Um, we are seeing PCOS in women of um, average body habitus, just as commonly as we're seeing it in our more um, heavy set population. Um, so not investigating this cause is really a disservice to, to women. The, um, the next one we are gonna talk about is your luteal phase defect. Um, and that is defined as a shortened cycle. So a cycle less than 25 days. Uh, it's really characterized by low progesterone and caused by stress. <laughs> um, like I kind of mentioned earlier, your body doesn't know the difference between physical stress and mental emotional stress. So this could be, you know, a, um, either a woman who is going uh, through a high stress job through school, having, um, you know, interpersonal uh, relationship issues. Um, and unfortunately, once you start trying to conceive and it doesn't happen right away, that just ratchets up the level of stress and can actually worsen, um, you know, a luteal phase de defect. Um, this actually was my concern. Uh, when I was a fourth year in medical school, um, I was your typical type A, uh, wanting to get into residency, running my class. I was president of my, my medical school class. Uh, my father became very ill during my fourth year of medical school. Um, and my cycles shortened to 21 days and I was bleeding for seven of those. So that was, yeah, <laughs> that was something that really had to be addressed. Um, and unfortunately, you know, the stress piece didn't, <laughs> didn't resolve itself very quickly. Um, but there are definitely strategies that we can take with, you know, acupuncture, um, supplementing progesterone, herbs, to try and move that back into the right direction. So you're not just 
bleeding your face off for, for seven days out of, out of the month or out of every three weeks, I guess. Um, the third and kind of the most underdiagnosed is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So this is actually an autoimmune um, attack on your thyroid. Um, and we see it um, kind of pop up in women as subclinical hypothyroid. Um, so if you go to an allopathic physician, um, they will typically just run a TSH, which is your um, thyroid stimulating hormone. It's a signal from your brain to your thyroid to do its job, right? Um, that is really an incomplete picture. Um, and also the, the um, tolerance of the lab value there could be very different than what a naturopathic physician might look at and um, consider. Um, the mechanism for this is unclear on why it causes uh, problems with ovulation and problems with fertility, um, but we do see that when um, you know Hashimoto's thyroiditis is um, diagnosed and managed, it actually helps the efficacy of fertility treatments. So women who are undergoing um, IVF treatments already they get on a little bit of thyroid hormone and it actually helps um, their IVF treatments take. Um, while the documented mechanism is unclear, um, there is a thought process of, you know, the thyroid beating part of the HPA axis. So the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal kind of axis. Um, what that means is that there are three systems that really work together um, to create a balanced hormonal picture. We have our thyroid gland, we have our adrenal glands, and we have our sex hormones. And when I speak to patients in my office, I really try to get them to consider these as three legs of a stool, right? So if you kick out a leg of a stool and it's left with only two, that, that stool doesn't stand up very well. Um, so with Hashimoto's, we really have that attack on the thyroid gland. You're kicking out that leg and the other two, so your adrenals and your sex hormones are going to have to pick up the slack there. So that's kind of the best understanding of why this is affecting fertility so strongly for people. Um, and the last one I have on here is endometriosis. This is not an all encompassing list of, of things that may be affecting fertility, um, but it is a fairly comprehensive and kind of the top four that we see affecting women. Um, so endometriosis is the endometrial tissue uh, forming outside of the uterine cavity. Um, this causes very significant and painful um, menses for women suffering from endometriosis. Typically, it is a um, estrogen dominance issue. Um, and the gold standard for diagnosis of endometriosis is actually a laparoscopy. So it's a surgical procedure um, because they have to visualize these um, tissue formations outside of the uterine cavity. Um, if you want to be a little less uh, intense with looking at um, if this is possibly a diagnosis that you need to consider, um, CA-125 is a marker that we can find in the blood. It, it is actually elevated in most cases of endometriosis. Um, it was previously thought of as more of a cancer marker, um, but definitely something to consider before you head down the laparoscopy route um, if you are thinking of a diagnosis of endometriosis. So what do we do from here? What do we do with all this information? If you are speaking to a physician and you are concerned about your fertility, the physician should be taking a very thorough history. That is a personal history for you, a family history, because a lot of these issues tend to run in families. Um, they should be asking about your partner's medical history. Have they had a workup for um, you know, sperm um, motility um, and count, that sort of thing. They should be evaluating your stress because as we've seen, you know, with the luteal phase defect, especially, um, stress can be a big part of that. It also plays a big factor when we are thinking about PCOS because it can change the way that your body does metabolize sugars, um, which leads to that insulin resistance picture that we do see with PCOS patients. And they should also be evaluating your diet, right? Um, food is medicine. What you're putting in your mouth is either feeding your body and your soul, or it's kind of feeding disease. Um, what labs should they be running? I'm not advocating for 
a you know spaghetti against the wall uh <laughs> seeing what sticks kind of mentality here but this is kind of a thorough list of things that you should be considering um, and then kind of choosing uh, labs based on what best fits your diagnostic picture after you talk about your full full history um, so for sex hormones um, definitely running an fsh and an estradiol so that follicular stimulating hormone and the, um, the main estrogen responsible for, um, for fertility on day three. That's when those um, two things should be peaking in your body. Uh, progesterone and your luteinizing hormone should then be run on day 21. Um, testosterone can really be run on any day. Um, it's, it doesn't fluctuate in the same uh, capacity as your estrogen and your progesterone. Um, if you're considering a diagnosis of uh, PCOS, they should definitely be looking at a fasting insulin, a fasting glucose, an HbA1c, and vitamin D. Uh, we actually see that women with PCOS um, tend to have very significantly depressed vitamin D levels. Um, and I'm also going to skip down a few because homocysteine can actually be um, super important when we are considering um, fertility with PCOS. Um, homocysteine is a marker that is elevated when you are insufficient in B vitamins. Um, I have the plus or minus MTHFR here. So MTHFR is a gene mutation that actually affects the way that we um, are able to process and utilize our B vitamins. Um, some people have a um, two-point mutation here where really they can't process their B vitamins effectively at all. Um, some people have a one-point mutation where it's just a slight um, you know, disruption of this pattern. Um, it is a genetic marker um, and it's definitely something that you can run, um, but having a methylated B vitamin in your prenatal vitamins is, is just good medicine. So uh, whether or not you're, <laughs> you're testing for the gene mutation or not, um, you really should be getting um, adequate Bs to get that homocysteine level affected um, more than um, necessarily knowing about the genetic predisposition. Um, other labs to consider, right? We need to look at our thyroid comprehensively since Hashimoto's thyroiditis is a very common cause of, of infertility and recurrent loss. Um, and that is a lot more comprehensive than a lot of women are given at their, their OBGYN office. So that really should include a TSH, which is that thyroid stimulating hormone. So that signal from the brain to the thyroid telling it to make thyroid hormone, a free T4. Um, so in response to that signal, um, your thyroid actually makes uh, T4, which is the inactive form of the hormone. It has to be released from the thyroid gland and go out to the body where it's actually converted to T3. Um, T3 is the active form of the hormone. So if there's a problem at any step in that process, um, we need to know about it so we know where to um, correctly intervene, right? The next thing on that list is a TPO antibody. And that is what tells us um, about Hashimoto's thyroiditis. That is that um, antibody that is specifically targeting the thyroid, um, creating that autoimmune condition. Um, also looking at antithyroglobulin. Um, which is affecting, again, um, the immune system's response to your thyroid and your um, thyroid hormone. Next on the list is your AM cortisol and your DHEAS. Um, DHEAS is a backbone or precursor hormone. So there's a very complex um, hormone pathway that I kind of spared you guys from in this, in this 101 style lecture. Um, but your, all of your sex hormones and your cortisol, I'll actually start with the backbone of cholesterol. Um, so cholesterol gets converted down several different pathways. Um, and we need to know kind of where things are being diverted or not converted correctly so that we can really intervene in the appropriate spots. Um, knowing your level of DHEA um, is important because DHEA can go to testosterone, which then is converted to estrogen or DHEA can go to cortisol, which is your stress hormone. Uh, we talked about you know, how important stress is in this whole picture, and that's why, because it can really pull on this, this DHEA backbone and pull it away from your testosterone and your estrogen pathway, um, which leads to you know, issues with your, with your sex hormones. Um, and that can be 
lowered or depressed in um, mental, emotional stress and physical stress. So really evaluating if that's part of your issue, where that's coming from and how to best manage that. Uh, prolactin can be very important because if you have um, excess prolactin, uh, which is why nursing mothers um, don't conceive right away, um, it actually depresses the whole um, sex hormone system. Um, and then looking for any uh, problems with anemia. Anemia can be a sneak culprit too, um, especially if you've been having you know, significant heavy bleeding uh, with like a luteal phase defect or something like that. Looking at ferritin, iron, and your total iron binding capacity, which is what TIBC stands for, can let us know if we're having any deficiencies in iron that may be leading to problems with um, you know, conception or, or um, carrying a pregnancy to term. So I know that was a lot of information in a very short amount of time. Um, so we are gonna open it up to questions. Um, I know I saw something pop up in the chat a little while ago. Oh, that was our contact information from Olivia. Thank you, Olivia. Um, but if you do have any questions, I really encourage you to reach out. We do do 15 minute uh, free consults with patients. If you're considering, you know, hey, is this even the right route for me to go down and investigate? We'd love to have you in the office, chat with you about your personal you know, case history and what may or may not need to be considered um, in your case. Perfect. Um, thank you, Dr. Morgan, for hosting this webinar. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, if you do have any questions, general questions that you would like answered, feel free to type them into the chat. We'll give it a couple minutes, um, come back to it, see if anyone had any questions. Um, this is also a recorded webinar. So if you missed the beginning or you wanna go back and watch, watch a section, um, we'll be sharing this to the emails that you registered with. Um, and if you liked what you learned tonight and want to learn more about fertility and pregnancy, um, I highly recommend following Dr. Morgan on Instagram and subscribing to our Ethos YouTube channel. Um, Dr. Morgan recently started a fun new series on our YouTube channel called Shit They Don't Tell You. I uh, wasn't sure if I should curse there or not. Um, <laughs> and our first series is on pregnancy. So we've got a handful of guests, uh, guest ex experts to talk about like back pain in pregnancy, um, what skincare is safe, what nutri nutrients and nutrition you should be considering, um, even what to expect with the whole birthing process from an OBGYN herself. So that was really cool. Um, if you're interested, definitely check out those videos. I've linked them in the chat below. Um, and then I hope you learned something new from the webinar tonight. If you take anything away, I hope you understand that if you do have questions that you feel were not being addressed in your health, there is a physician out there who will take the time to listen to you, answer those for you, um, work with you to create a solid treatment plan that aligns with your health and your lifestyle and your goals. Um, so again, I don't know if we had any questions. If you have any, we're wrapping it up now. So definitely type it in. We have one. So just for clarification, the six days during the ovulation phase, should you be having intercourse regularly? So it's really the um, six days right before ovulation because the sperm's going to be viable within the cervix and the uterus um, for approximately five days. Um, so it's the five days leading up to ovulation and the day of ovulation. Um, if your partner has adequate sperm count, that shouldn't be a problem having um, intercourse on all of those days. Um, if your partner has a lowered sperm count, you may want to do every other day um, so that you're kind of giving the swimmers the best chance that they, that they have. <laughs> go little buddies, go. <laughs> go little guys. Perfect. Well, thank, thank you so much for the question. That was really great. Um, if you have any more, definitely type them into the chat. Um, again, you can also schedule a free 15-minute consultation with Dr. Morgan. Um, she can answer more questions in depth for you. And if you're interested, um, you can call our office and Lindsay and I can get you scheduled for that. Um, and then thanks again, everyone, for tuning into tonight's webinar. We look forward to connecting with you soon and hope you have a great rest of your week.